The darkest year in human history. The sun vanished for 18 months, plunging the world into an endless cold that marked the beginning of humanity's darkest chapter. The year 536 AD isn't just another date in history books. It represents the start of a catastrophic chain of events that nearly drove mankind to extinction and forever altered the course of our civilization. Imagine waking each morning for over a year and a half to find the sky covered by a gray veil, unable to distinguish day from night, while temperatures dropped so low that summers resembled perpetual winters. This was the reality our ancestors experienced when a colossal volcanic eruption in Iceland shrouded the northern hemisphere's skies with a blanket of ash that almost completely blocked sunlight. If you're finding this story as fascinating as it is terrifying, don't forget to follow us and hit like to receive more content like this. What makes 536 AD such a dramatic turning point in world history is the unprecedented concatenation of disasters. It wasn't just an isolated event, but the beginning of what modern historians have termed the late antique Little Ice Age. Research conducted at the University of Maine's Climate Change Institute, led by medieval historian Michael McCormick and glaciologist Paul Majowski, revealed through ultra-precise analysis of ice from a Swiss glacier that the 536 eruption was only the first blow in a series of three massive eruptions that kept the world plunged in cold for nearly a full century. The Byzantine chronicler Procopius of Caesarea, an eyewitness to this apocalyptic phenomenon, described the situation in blood-chilling words. The sun gave forth its light without brightness, like the moon. Meanwhile, Roman Senator Cassiodorus wrote in 538, The sun seems to have lost its usual light and appears of a bluish color. We marvel at seeing our bodies cast no shadows at noon and feel the mighty vigor of its heat has been diminished. For people living in that era, deeply superstitious and fearful of divine omens, it wasn't difficult to believe they were witnessing the end of the world. The immediate consequences were devastating. Average summer temperatures dropped between 1.5 and, and 2.5 and degrees Celsius, which may seem minor, but in climatic terms represented a catastrophe for medieval agriculture. The decade between 536 and 545 has been scientifically confirmed as the coldest in the last 2,300 years, causing the simultaneous collapse of agricultural systems across Europe, Asia and Africa. In Ireland, chronicles attest that there was a failure of bread from 536 to 539. In China, it snowed during summer, something never seen before, and harvests were equally disastrous, causing massive famines. Similar phenomena were documented in Mesopotamia and Scandinavia. Widespread hunger triggered large population movements which, in turn, provoked armed conflicts between desperate populations competing for increasingly scarce resources. But the worst was yet to come. As if nature wanted to ensure humanity wouldn't recover easily, in 5 and 40 or 5 and 41 a second, massive volcanic eruption occurred, once again reducing European summer temperatures by one and a half to two and a half degrees. And to complete the triad of catastrophes, in 547, a third major volcanic event took place. These successive eruptions, combined with increased ocean ice cover due to low temperatures, created a negative feedback cycle that kept the planet plunged in cold for decades. Can you imagine living in a world where the sky remains darkened for years and each summer is colder than the last. If you find this story as fascinating as I do, take a second to like and subscribe. You won't want to miss our upcoming accounts of humanity's most crucial moments. The climate crisis was merely the prelude to a greater catastrophe. Between 541 and 543, bubonic plague, known as the Plague of Justinian, for the Byzantine emperor ruling at that time, spread from Egypt throughout the Mediterranean, decimating entire populations. This devastating pandemic killed between 35 and 55 percent of the Eastern Roman Empire's population and extended throughout Africa, Asia and Europe, claiming between 25 and 50 million lives, approximately one-fifth of the world's population at that time. Emperor Justinian himself fell ill, though he survived the plague. The first city affected was Pelusium, a trading center in the Nile Delta, 
from where it rapidly spread to Alexandria and subsequently to Constantinople. According to historian and cleric John of Ephesus, who believed this disease had been sent by God to punish human sins, in Constantinople between 5,000 and 12,000 people died daily, totaling 300,000 deaths in the imperial capital alone. John of Ephesus left behind a chilling testimony. Citizens died in churches, in streets, in porticos, everywhere, and their bodies remained unburied, which undoubtedly worsened the epidemic. Procopius of Caesarea estimated that the plague killed 10,000 people daily in the capital. And this initial outbreak between 5141 and 5143 was just the first in a series of 18 plague waves that ravaged the Mediterranean basin until 750, keeping the population in a state of terror and permanent crisis for over two centuries. The economic and demographic weakness suffered by the empire during this period favored invasions by peoples considered barbarians by the Romans, such as the Avars, Slavs, and Mongols. The high mortality rate reduced the number of available soldiers, and economic fragility made it difficult to pay barbarians to withdraw from invaded territories, as had been common practice in previous centuries. Some historians consider it likely that the increase in invasions and wars was directly related to the darkening of the sun, caused by volcanic ash, creating a logical chain of disasters. Less sun generated cold. Cold caused poor harvests. These produced hunger. Hunger triggered migrations in search of more fertile lands, and migrations caused social and political instability, ultimately resulting in wars when they took the form of invasion of foreign territories. As if all this suffering wasn't enough, between 570 and 670, the entire Mediterranean basin, from the Near East to Western Europe, was repeatedly struck by enormous locust plagues that devastated croplands. The Gallo-Roman historian Gregory of Tours left testimony of the locust plague that ravaged Hispania in 578, especially around Toledo, where fruits, vines, and all types of plants were devoured by insects. One possible explanation for this phenomenon is that locust plagues occur more frequently on abandoned agricultural lands, as these insects prefer areas with diverse plant species, something unusual in exploited and maintained fields. The plague epidemic having killed so many people, including in rural areas, prepared the ground for the succession of locust plagues that followed. It wasn't until 640, more than a century after the fateful year 536, that the economy began to recover and, with it, the general welfare of the population, at least that of the civilizations that didn't disappear during this terrible period. In addition to its direct effects on harvests, the prolonged cold period that began in 536 caused anomalies that intensified certain meteorological phenomena so harmful to humans that they led to the collapse of several advanced societies. In ancient Peru, for example, this period saw the beginning of the decline of the Moche or Mochica culture, established in urban centers in the valleys of the northern coast of present-day Peru. Despite being a prosperous and advanced civilization, with rich craftsmanship and extensive commercial networks, their food supply, like that of the vast majority of societies at the time, was secured by agriculture and, to a lesser extent, fishing. In the 6th century, the Mochicas began to suffer the devastating consequences of the phenomenon we know today as El Niño, produced by abnormal warming of surface waters in the central and eastern Pacific that causes alterations in atmospheric circulation patterns. In some regions it causes major droughts, while in others it produces torrential rains. The territory of the Mochi culture was battered for many years by a long period of endless rains that destroyed part of their adobe buildings. Overflowing rivers flooded crops and drowned the inhabitants of cities located in the deepest valleys. Additionally, they eroded farmland for the future and favored fevers and epidemics. After these rains, between 563 and 594, the area suffered a drought lasting three decades destroying most sources for irrigating crops and triggering a desertification process. As a consequence, agriculture declined and widespread famine occurred. In 602, torrential rains returned, and finally between 636 and 645, 
another overwhelming decade of drought occurred. Additionally, El Niño also caused variations in ocean currents that limited anchovy fishing, an important pillar of the moche economy. Due to the hunger, misery and death brought by such an accumulation of natural disasters, the rulers, who unsuccessfully increased the number of human sacrifices to appease the deities, lost their people's favor. At the end of the 7th century, a new era of devastating rains caused by El Niño destroyed the irrigation systems of Galindo and Pampa Grande, believed to be the last capitals of Moche culture. Finally, these two administrative centers were abandoned around 750 and the political system collapsed. The remnants of this culture were conquered by the Huari, an Andean civilization that survived until the 13th century. On the other side of the Atlantic in Africa, the Kingdom of Axum, located in the territories of present-day Ethiopia and Eritrea, also suffered a series of droughts in the mid-6th century that weakened its economy and, with it, its power and influence. The population of the capital, also called Axum, drastically decreased and by the mid-7th century, Islamic powers in the region took control of trade routes with Alexandria and Byzantium, signifying its definitive decline. In the Indian subcontinent, meanwhile, the Gupta dynasty, which had created one of the greatest political and military empires in Indian history, ended in 550, right during the incipient period of climatic anomalies caused by the 536 eruption, although in its case the relationship between its decline and meteorological phenomena is not as clear, since its power had begun to wane many decades earlier, after a defeat by the Huns who intended to advance into northern India. Perhaps the cold period after 536 intensified Hun invasions in their desire to move southward, but there are no records confirming this. What is clear is that recent advances in scientific fields such as ice core analysis allow us to shed light not only on paleoclimatology, but also on archaeology and history, providing relevant information about times from which very few written records survive. Another very useful instrument in this regard is dendroclimatology, that is, the study of past climates based on the properties of tree growth rings, you know, those circles that can be seen in a tree trunk when it's cut down. In fact, the work of German dendroclimatologist Ulf Bündgen provided evidence of the volcanic eruptions that darkened the sky in the 6th century and their effects on tree growth across Europe. Trees, silent witnesses to human history, tell us of periods of splendor and decline. The millennial larch from Chile, known as Great Grandfather, and located in Alerce Costero National Park, according to studies by Chilean scientist Antonio Lara, is estimated to be more than 5,480 years old, much older than, for example, the Egyptian pyramids. We cannot be 100% certain it's the oldest on the planet, as Chilean scientists, due to the trunk's size, have been unable to extract a sample of the complete core to determine its age with precision. They only managed to reach 40% of the tree. But if the 5,400 years were confirmed, it means this tree already existed in the year 3,455 BC, when writing had not yet been invented and humanity was taking its first steps towards civilization. This tree would have witnessed the rise and fall of countless cultures and civilizations, would have survived natural cataclysms, climate changes, and plagues like the one that ravaged the world from the year 536. What secrets might its rings hold? What stories could it tell us if it could speak? The study of history shows us that climate has always played a fundamental role in the development of human societies. It's no coincidence that civilizations flourished where the most favorable conditions for harvests existed. From the ancient cultures of Mesopotamia, through the Roman Empire, to Egypt and ancient Greece, all prospered primarily thanks to harvest surpluses that translated into trade goods and wealth. In colder or hotter areas, where humans had to maintain a constant struggle with nature to obtain the food necessary for survival, it was much more difficult to develop complex social structures, devote time to art, science, or philosophy. All effort had to be concentrated on mere survival. What makes the study of the year 536 and its aftermath especially interesting is that it highlights our species' extreme vulnerability to abrupt climate changes. Despite all our current technology, 
we remain fundamentally dependent on climate stability to maintain our agricultural systems and therefore our survival as a species. At a time when anthropogenic climate change threatens to drastically alter our planet's weather conditions, looking back to that fateful year 536 can offer us valuable lessons about our fragility and our capacity for adaptation. The main difference between those times and ours is that today we have scientific knowledge and technology to anticipate many of these changes and adapt to them. But the question remains whether we will be able to act with the necessary speed and determination to avoid a new little ice age, or worse still, global warming that could prove equally catastrophic for our civilization. It's fascinating to think that, despite all the catastrophes that have struck humanity throughout its history, from the 536 volcanic eruption to the world wars of the 20th century, our species has demonstrated a remarkable capacity for recovery. We have faced famines, plagues, wars and natural disasters, and yet here we are more numerous and technologically advanced than ever. This resilience is perhaps the most notable characteristic of our species. When all seems lost, when catastrophes accumulate one after another as happened from the year 536 onward, humanity finds a way to adapt, to survive, and eventually to prosper again. But we should not confuse this capacity for recovery with invulnerability. The history of the year 536 reminds us that we are fragile, that we depend on complex natural systems that can be drastically altered in a short time, and that when these systems fail, human suffering can be immense and prolonged. That is why it's so important to study these dark periods of our history. They not only help us better understand our past, but also offer us valuable lessons for our future. In an increasingly populated world with increasingly limited resources, the ability to anticipate and adapt to climate changes will be crucial for the survival of our civilization. The year 536 reminds us that nature has the power to dramatically alter the course of human history and that no civilization, however powerful, is safe from its onslaughts. It also teaches us that cooperation and adaptation are our best weapons against adversity. Perhaps the most important legacy of that fateful year is precisely this, reminding us of our vulnerability and at the same time, our extraordinary capacity to overcome the most adverse circumstances. A lesson we should not forget as we face the challenges of the 21st century. If you've made it this far, I'm enormously grateful for your attention. It has been a fascinating journey through one of the darkest and most challenging periods in human history. If you enjoyed this account of humanity's most tragic year, don't forget to like, comment on what you thought, and subscribe for more historical content that helps us better understand our past and hopefully build a brighter future. Until next time, 